Welcome to Armstrong Street Scene. This is season number 12. And with me today at the Packard National Packard Museum, we got Larry Ward from the Two Wheeled Power Hour, WKBN. Yeah, surprisingly, we're entering our 21st year of broadcasting the show Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock on 570 WKBN. But we're so excited. This year is the 20th anniversary of the motorcycle exhibit at the National Packard Museum. And this year's theme is two wheels at the county fair. So you're gonna see a lot of the historic racing bikes that raced in that era on flat track racing. And in addition to that, you're gonna see great motorcycles that people rode to the county fair to see the races. Sounds good. Can you tell he's from the radio side, huh? <laughs> Very good. We got a lot of bikes here tonight and a lot of them I never even heard of before. You know, so, and I hope you're up on these bikes. And well, a uh, couple of good things. Uh, I'm smart enough to know that when I'm not smart enough to go get somebody. And of course, our historian uh, on the radio show, the motorcycle, the Valley's historian is Larry Rabbit Smith. Okay. And he'll be along in a few minutes to talk about some of the uh, differences of the types of bikes that we're going to be displaying. But the unique thing is some of these bikes are, are raced locally. Uh, Jimmy Iacazelli. Uh, which owns Moto Zilli. He raced flat track at the Tum Trump Tum Trumbull, uh, Trumbull County Fairgrounds. And also Tom Duma, Tom Duma Fine Jewelers. You wouldn't think so, but he was a big time racer also. And he's one of the guys that supports, uh, what do they call Moto America, the off-road racing. And he gives away those great Hewer, tag Hewer watches, which I tried to get oh, off no, of. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, how much of those cost? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there, so he, we've got some, not only local guys that rose to great prominence in the 60s and 70s, but we've got some bikes like from George Roeder. He's got the Ted Booty bike that won a national championship. George Roeder also brought his XR750 that won the mile at P Pomona Speedway in California. So it's not only the local guys, but it's also the other guys that achieve great success uh, on the flat track racing. I can't wait to see that Greyhound on, over there. I, oh, guess, yeah. I guess that thing was underwater for how many years or something uh, when they I restored it? Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, a lot of people said, geez, I never even heard about a Greyhound. Me either. But you're going to see a Nickershum over there, one of three Say that bikes. Again. Nickershum. Like Nickershum. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to pronounce that one. Uh, absolutely. And you know, the good thing about that is uh, it's one of only three known in America, owned by Bruce Williams. And Bruce has done an awful lot for the motorcycle exhibit. And uh, if it wouldn't be for Bruce, we probably wouldn't have a, a motorcycle exhibit. So he uh, was kind enough to bring a, a very, very rare bike. I think everybody uh, will be pleasantly surprised. It's a total departure. We did off-road last year. Now we do flat track this year. So I think it's hard to top what we did last year, but I think this one's going to at least equal it. It's at the National Packard Museum over here in Warren, Ohio. And every year is a different theme, right? Absolutely. The uh, bikes. Yeah, last year uh, we had uh, off-road riding and uh, uh, it, we had like uh, bikes from the three-time uh, gold medalist Paul Danik. We had Mr. John Penton, the guy that uh, created the Penton Motorsport Cycles. He was here. We had uh, Jerry Young, the first American National Trials Champion, was here. So again, the theme has been: we're going to show you bikes that were actually in competition. We're going to show you some of the memorabilia from the riders that rode those bikes, and we're going to continue that theme to this year, which is flat track racing. Sounds good, Larry. I'm not going to do much talking tonight because I'm not much on old bikes, let alone new bikes, but you guys are going to... Well, I'll tell you what, Rick. I had a blast. i got to commend you guys. I sat there over Christmas and watched the street theme marathon. <laughs> I, 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 I watched it so much, and I went, oh, hey, I remember being there. Uh -huh. But I commend you and Greg for doing that each year, and boy, it's a lot of fun. And it's great to look back on what we did in the past sure. summer. Last time Larry and I got together, we're, uh, what, we did the motors, remember? Uh, a couple oh, years yeah. Ago. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I learned not to wear black and turn sideways. <laughs> God, the camera always puts on 10 pounds. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> hey, Larry, there's, so, a little bit more. there's a lot of nice bikes in there. I think, uh, what's, I think we should go in and check them out. Absolutely. Let's go. Let's go in and check them out.
Fields at the County Fair. It's a National Packard Museum. We have, we're concentrating today on what? Uh, but the um, flat track bikes, right? Uh, yeah, we've got speedway bikes, we've got flat track bikes, and we've got the bikes that people rode to come to see these things race. Mm -hmm. And I know that you want me to explain a lot about it, but I gotta tell you, I know enough not to talk about something I don't know enough about. So we've got- <laughs> I do that the every day. <laughs> the two wheel power hour has the Valley's motorcycle historian, none other than Larry Smith, better okay. known as Rabbit. The Rabbit. He's right over here. Come here, Rabbit, step right okay. in here. Hi, Rabbit. Hi. Welcome to a street scene. Wait, thank you. We got all kind of motorcycles here. You host with uh, Larry once in a while, right? Yes, I do. Okay, good, yes. good. And uh, you want to talk about the XR 750 Harley Davidsons? Sure. We have three of them here, okay. and they're they are uh, the alloy bikes that they they first introduced in around 1971. They had experimented with the iron head bikes, and so we have number 12, which was a factory bike at one time, raced by Ted Booty. They called him Too Tall Ted. And when the factory cut back on the side, uh, size of their sponsored racers, Ted went to, and got the sponsorship from Southeast Harley Davidson. Mm -hmm. And this is the machine he had. And, and uh, they were able, they, he was able to get it from the factory and continue racing it. So and, that's a stock factory racer right Yeah, there. stock, is, yes. Okay. Although, although they're, they're an exotic race bike, you know, specifically built to go in a circle, mm -hmm. 750 cc's or 45 cubic inches, Capable of doing around 120 miles an hour. Oh, that's good. Okay. Especially back in what, 76? Is that well, 76? I, I believe this is a 77. Okay. And so, um, Skip Eakin at Southeast Harley tuned the bikes for him, and he and he did was very successful at it. And then, because of his work with that, Skip Eakin went to the Honda factory and built the race bikes for Honda in, in 84, 5, 6, and 7, and he won the world, the AMA Grand National Championship that way. Mm -hmm. Then Ted continued to race that until till he retired from racing. This other bike here is is Warren Harley Davidson's XR750, and it was last raced by Ronnie Jones, and uh, <clears throat> it was tuned by Ted, or rather Dave Hubinski. Mm -hmm. And then you have number 66 is George Roeder the Second's motorcycle. That's his personal bike. He okay. usually runs it in exhibitions now although he won national races with it. Mm -hmm. And he has a shop, his dad was in, uh, within one point of being the national champion back oh. in 61 or 62. Uh, yeah. Up in, up up off of 20, up, up west of uh, Cleveland up okay. there. Yeah, okay, local. Monroeville, yeah. whatever okay. it is up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, his whole family, the Rotor family has always raced. His dad was called the Flying Farmer from Ohio. They have a farm up there. Will Roeder, his older brother, road raced. Jesse Roeder, his youngest brother, mm -hmm. road raced. Okay. So, so George Roeder has used this bike up up recently to do exhibitions, like at the vintage meet in Wauseon, where he'd he'd battle with uh, Jay Springsteen, a past uh, Grand National champion, of, and. Uh, so how much, how fast would this one go compared to the other ones? They about, all about the same. All about the same. Uh, They're, they, they, over the years pushed them between like about 80 horsepower mm -hmm. up to just around 100 horsepower. Mm -hmm. But once you reach that 100 horsepower, the reliability goes away. But so like on a mile track, they're around 130, 35. And on a half mile, they're at 120, 125. It's funny that on the other side, there's a photograph of them working on a bike. Yeah. That's, that's George Roeder Sr. Oh, okay. Okay, and he's at Ashland. Uh -huh. And when he's running against another kid from Ohio here named Ronnie Rawl, Ronnie still races. Okay, and he's in his 80s. Now, now George and Ronnie would battle. Ronnie on his BSA, George on his mm -hmm. his K model, WR. So, so at, at the, when the Middle Ohio brought in the road races, they brought them into half mile into Ashland County. Mm -hmm. And so many people showed up to see George and, and Ronnie battle it out that they decided we need to bring vintage bikes in here. And that started really the vintage motorcycle flat oh, track cool. in Ohio. Yeah, okay. So you have, you have them racing around on bikes a, a 54 or six, 54 KR, okay, on George Rotor. And you had, you had Ronnie on a 58 BSA, okay. They were less than a second slower than the 
pros running around on oh, a half wow. mile. So, right? Oh wow! And they were on much smaller tires and much much less horsepower. So, so when they're racing these things, are they on dirt or are they on asphalt? Dirt. Dirt. This is all dirt racing. All dirt racing. Okay. From the from the it it all springs from the fact that that you have that you have bicycles racing on right. velodromes, wooden tracks, and you have them racing on half mile horse tracks. All right. Okay, and small tracks, all kinds of racing. So in, by the 18, 1890s or so, you have people in Europe copying the small combustion engines, mm -hmm. and they clipped them on the bicycles, and they called the engines clip-ons, and okay. so they, they then used a the bike to break the wind so that five bicycles behind them in draft they get them up to 40 miles an hour, pull the bike off, and away the bicycle. So they were drafting back in 1890. They knew about the draft. Yes. Okay. And so, so then they decided, well, let's race the bicycles with the engines on them. Uh -huh. Okay. So they first had the one pursuit where one would start on either side, and they go around until one tries to overtake the other. And then they would actually started racing them. Uh -huh. And by 1910, you have 100 or so manufacturers, so there was a lot of people out there racing. And in, in uh, 1906 or so, a guy named Prince started building board tracks. You have the smallest one up at uh, of an amusement park, up Luna Amusement Park in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and that was, that was less than an eighth of a mile around. And you had them all the way out to two miles. And it would take them one week to build a board track. These weren't flat tracks, though, were they? These were, were banked ovals were in, the, banked, in, the, yeah. in the... In the, in the Spectators were up on the top. Uh -huh. Oh, jeez! <laughs> and, and by 1910, they were doing over 100 miles an hour on the wooden tracks. On the wooden tracks, wow. beating the cars easily. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. And so it wasn't long. Well, by 1902, they were beginning to race those bikes mm -hmm. on the agricultural park outside of L.A. So you've always had that combination. And since since uh, all the fairgrounds have half mile tracks horse tracks around them or a mile horse, you know, horse right. track. Right. It was easy for them to keep those tracks and getting spectators in there to bring the motorcycles in the race. So it, it just sprang right along and over the years they changed the classes until you have, these bikes are classified as class C mm -hmm. in which they were based on street machines. All right. right. And so since most people, you didn't have to go far out of town before you were riding on a dirt road. Mm -hmm. So most people were the kids were used to riding on the dirt, so it was easy for the local clubs or promoters to get people to race mm -hmm. on a half mile. And so it really sprang up in the 30s, carried them through the 30s into the 40s and stuff. And, and uh, So when did asphalt come in? When did they start they, to... The only, they only raced these type of bikes on asphalt for five years uh -huh. down, in, down in the south. Right. And it began in 87 mm -hmm. at Myrtle Beach, and they... And they um, Ran the, the one the one bike oh the one bike that's on the other side of the display over here mm -hmm. was actually raced down there at Myrtle Beach at the Myrtle Beach Speedway, and and they raced on there that oval a half mile oval that was asphalt and they'd get really old tires that were hard as a rock so they could slide around a turn just like they slide in the dirt, mm -hmm. but so, so they, these bikes have never well they they that's enough just to say they've never raced on asphalt right. the road racing that's another story. Right. And so by the time that's what I see a lot now these days, those guys. Are, oh yeah, the oh, Moto GPs. Yeah, what are the what are the speeds on those? 180 miles an hour. Oh, or something? some of the bikes go over 200 miles an hour. On the road racing. On the road racing course, when they're in Spa, Belgium, they're going over 200 miles an hour on the straightaway. On the, the motorcycle. On the motorcycle. <laughs> wow. The jet helicopters, those helicopters cannot overtake them. Wow, wow, okay. that's something. That's fast. <laughs> and so these, they all sprang out of being being street bikes in that and they just kept getting faster do they still and faster. do this on the dirt oh yes do they okay. yes i know the hill climbs and stuff like that they do that and the dirt and all that yeah so the hill climbs have, have gone downhill a little okay. bit around here it was their own success right you had the greater akron running hills climbs up in peninsula uh -huh. and they had a stop by 64 because there was 25,000 people there and the wow. cars closed down 305. Mm -hmm. The city, they couldn't get anyone up and down the street there from everybody parking. We used to do a lot of dirt race. That's where I learned uh, when I was a young chap uh, how to ride a motorcycle in the dirt. Oh, I think that's uh, the best way oh, to learn yeah. how to oh, ride yeah, a motorcycle. For sure. Yeah. You, it's really Rain, whatever you get yeah. on the street or oil or grease, you're going you're gonna to be able to sure. tolerate it.
Okay, with me now I have uh, Bruce Williams with me. From, uh, he's one of the coordinators of uh, the... Well, was I retired. Oh, you retired? Well, you did it for, what, 19 years? 18. Uh, 18 years there, okay. And Bruce, I understand you really know a lot about the next couple bikes coming up here, and I can't even pronounce this one we're in front of right now. But can we talk about it? Well, this is a 1906 Neckersolm. A Neckersolm. And it was made in Neckersolm, Germany. Okay. In later years, they were known as NSU. And at one time, they were the largest manufacturer. I, I can in the see world. why it was NSU. It's a lot easier to say. When they did a lot of export, they shortened and just used the three letters. And many companies did that. But this one uh, was in an open stairwell in Philadelphia for many, many years. And when I got it, well, the box here shows the parts that were unusable. And the frame is original, uh, the gas tank is copper, it's original. Uh, the fenders we had to make, we couldn't find any. There's nothing in the way of parts in Europe for these. They're just too rare. Anything you need, you have to make. So what year is this one here? This is 1906. 1906. It's a 410cc inlet over exhaust motor, three and a half horsepower, and it's got a two-speed transmission with two clutches, a clutch for each gear. It's got two brakes, a rubbing block on the rear belt pulley and a contracting band on the rear wheel. Pedal start on Pedal start. Pedal uh, start. Kick start didn't come till around 12 or 13. Okay. Single cylinder. Yes, this one's a single, but at that time they also made twins. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me go over a couple of things with you. I'm not familiar with it, and I'm sure our listeners, our viewers aren't familiar with it either. How about these things here? What is this? Uh... That's a hand oil pump. You open the valve at the bottom after you draw the tube full of oil, and then set your drip rate to four or five drops and it drops down onto the flywheels and, and oils the motor. These motors are total loss. There's no oil pump and they don't recirculate. If you don't have a blue haze coming out of the exhaust pipe, you don't have enough oil going through it. And they're actually made to use oil as a consumable. Okay, how about this gizmo here? That is the throttle. That's, that's the throttle. Yes, it's a lever throttle and on top of that there's an air tube that you can adjust the airflow into the carburetor. That's all hand then? Everything by hand. Carburetor's what, right? The carburetor is below it. Bottom the, thing on the point Yes, there. the little yeah. tube going to the cylinder is a heater for the carburetor so it doesn't ice. <laughs> and this was the first year that they offered an inlet valve that was mechanical. All the earlier ones had a, a vacuum inlet valve. That's a carbide tank. Carbide rock would go in the bottom, uh, water in the top. You would set the drip and then light the headlight and it would burn acetylene gas. Oh, okay, that's for the headlight then? Yes. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure that's what a that was. That's okay. a generator for the headlight. Okay, and then we got a handle on the other that side. That handle is a rear brake lever. That's how you stop it? One of them. <laughs> the handle on the other side is compression release. That's how you stop it too, a handle like that. Yes, you can use compression release or you can, or you can, this one actually has a key. So you could use the key also. 1906 German, how do you say that again? Neckersolm. Neckersolm. And how many of these are in existence? There's part of a 1905 in Minnesota and this one in the U.S. that I'm aware of. That's it? Yes. Uh, there's one in a museum in Germany. Have you seen pictures of it? Yes. Okay. Yes, I've been to Europe on parts hunts. Okay, good luck, huh? So they, this company was in existence for how long? Till the late 60s. Oh, to the late 60s? Yes. Okay, but this one here, the... It was the, the company was called the Necker Stitching Machine Union. Oh, okay. And then by 1909, they shortened and called it NSU. Okay. And they made from 5 till the 60s, they made cars and motorcycles. Oh, okay. Never heard of them before. They, in the 50s, they were the largest manufacturer of motorcycles in the world. Wow. Really? They made 350,000 machines in one year. Wow, and I never heard of them. <laughs> well, you're not old enough. <laughs> I'm old enough, believe me. <laughs> I just don't know much. Let's slide over here. This one here is really interesting to me, and it's got a nice history behind it. It's a it's a 1909 Greyhound single. Right. And it was found underwater uh, in New Hampshire. They had taken the back wheel off it and put a saw blade on it and used it as an ice saw. <laughs> and it must have gone through the ice, and uh -huh. uh, one spring they were scraping the lake to try to find snowmobiles that had gone through and this came up 
sat for many years in deplorable condition and Bruce Lindsay restored it. But it is the original motor, it's got cast iron crank cases. Um, the box below the gas tank is a battery box. This is a battery ignition model. It doesn't have a magneto. So you use dry cell batteries. The round tank by the seat post is the oil tank. The wing nut on the top is how you would set your drip feed. How many drops go into the motor. Again, pedal start. They're pretty much all pedal start. <laughs> that early they were either push, push. run and jump. Okay. Or as my book says, run and vault to the seat. <laughs> oh, that's what it says. Yeah, yeah. That, that's in the original literature. Okay. And you got that, like, like bicycle brakes on the front here, huh? No, there's no brake on the front. Oh, there's none at all? What is this here? That's a linkage for the little front fork. Oh, okay. It actually has a little bit of travel in the front fork, about two inches. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. This is a Greyhound single. Made it one year. How many of these exist? I believe there's one other one. That's it. That's to my knowledge. How do you like to know what these things are worth? You know, you got uh, like this one here. You got, you I restored them. Uh huh. What you can get for them, huh? <laughs> They're worth what the buyer will pay. Right. What, what, uh, what number are we talking on this? Um, I've seen them go in the 200,000 range. Wow. Wow. So it depends on how bad someone wants one in their collection. How bad they want it and how rare it is. Right. Well, they're rare. They're rare. Okay, let's move on back to this one here. The one in the back is a nine, Indian single. 1912 That's a Indian 12. racer. These are all three of these we just went over are racers, right? No. No? No? No, mine's got headlights on it. Okay. No, the Indian is, is set up as a racer. It's got abbreviated rear fender. It's got the drop handlebars, which basically they just ported the motors and ran them wide open. Now that's a Magneto model, so it's got a Magneto up in front of the motor. Right there, that black box. Yeah, the black box is a mag. The carburetor's in front of the cylinder. Hi. And a lot of times if these raced on the board tracks, they would just run them with the carburetor wild, wired wide open <laughs> and just it. control them with the kill button. So how'd you stop them? There's no brakes. <laughs> Compression release? Yes. Okay. But but that's not really, I mean, it would just go until it slowed down by itself. Right. Right. No quick stops. Right? Nope, they were not made to stop. They were made to go. I see two chains on this, three chains on this one. One, two, three. Well, one's the primary chain, the short one off the motor. Mm -hmm. Then the second one is the drive chain, and the chain on the other side is the pedal start. So the past three, this is the only racer. These are yes. basically just... Uh, they would be considered a street model. In the early days, lights were optional. Even into the 20s, lights were optional. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't buy a bike with lights. They would come as an extra charge. Mm -hmm. good, Bruce. And on the Necker Solm, it came without a clutch. If you wanted a clutch, you paid extra. Oh, okay. So this what, one actually has the clutch. This was does not. It's direct drive. How many speeds you have on this? Single. Just a sing all three of these are single speed. No, the Necker Solm is a two speed. Okay. It has an epicyclic clutch in the front hub. A what? Epicyclic, a sun and a sun and planet gear set inside the front hub. Oh, okay. Very complicated. It's, the name's complicated. Everything's complicated. It, it, was, it was a tough one to restore. Yeah. So how'd you, how long did it take you to restore that? Well, in between getting the knee and open heart, seven years. Okay. <laughs> okay. But like I say, nothing could be bought. We had to make everything. Right. We made the cam, made the spokes, made the rims, made the pulleys. What did you want to go for that one there? I like German stuff. Uh -huh. I like their engineering. At the time they were brought out, they were the most advanced machine in the world. They're just amazing. And you said at this time, like in the early 1900s, how many uh, models did you say were out at the time? Oh, uh, before 1910, there were probably 300 manufacturers. Of motorcycles? Oh, yeah. Wow. I didn't realize that. Oh, there were half a dozen in Ohio. I think at one time there were 50 in Ohio. Wow. This is all new to me. It's like I'm uh, mud, mud up on motorcycles, especially the old ones.
With me now, I have uh, Ted Guthrie. Ted's really into restoring these uh, motorcycles the correct way, as I understand. As Larry w Ward said, he said, this guy knows his stuff. Well, thank you, uh, Rick. Now, once again, with, with everyone has some level of capacity and understanding and capability of a restoration, as we may call it, which is a much misaligned term, but nonetheless, uh, we have some beautiful examples here, such as this Harley, that uh, truly do show what can be done when someone focuses on all of the details, every single last little thing. Now, one thing that's quite common, and uh, it's certainly understandable, but many folks do basically over-restore machine. That is, they go beyond what the original uh, paint was, what the polished surfaces may have appeared, what the fasteners were. So it all depends on what you wish to achieve when doing a quote unquote restoration. So it's all in the eye of the beholder, of course, and what uh, generally you feel is going to appeal to folks and what is going to be uh, satisfying in your own mind with what the ultimate achievement is going to be. But uh, nonetheless, uh, once again, this is a very fine example. Many, many uh, very correctly done bits and pieces. Uh, fasteners, of course, even right down to the correct finish on the fasteners themselves. Absolutely essential if you're going for a true restoration. Some things, of course, are simply not available, period. They have to be fabricated mm -hmm. or um, provided by some specialty supplier. Now, if one cares to look very, very closely at individual items, you know, you can, you can certainly find something because, believe me, coming from one who understands and knows the pitfalls of all this sort of thing, it's very easy to make a mistake. It's very easy to have something occur that just doesn't work out the way you wanted it to. So, uh, but in the end, once again, it sure looks good. Sure does. Like in a car, when you get everything down to the nut and bolt and to the correct thing, that's a concourse restoration. That's where you go like the Pebble Beach and, and the concourse alagances and all that. And that's when these things are worth a lot of money. That's where the collectors want to say, okay, this thing is done right. In, indeed, if mm -hmm. that is what you're specifically looking to achieve, mm -hmm. and again, Rick, as you describe when you go to the car shows and they're, they're going for points, as they call it, and someone could come along and they could take take any restoration, any rebuild, and find something that is not exactly correct. But as we, as we indicated, that's all in what you're looking to achieve. A lot of times you're just looking for a very, very fine, very good looking machine, mm -hmm. and hopefully one that, that runs well and still performs right. and operates and can be utilized and enjoyed. Many of those cars that uh, go for the points there, are not even driven, mm -hmm. you know. There's, they're, they're strictly um, they're, show cars right? or show bikes, yep. yeah. In fact, right. uh, at some of the events, as you indicated, they had to uh, they had to enact a requirement that the vehicle actually did have to run. Some people were putting them back together and they weren't even capable of functioning. They were just mm -hmm. pushing them around. So there has to be a, a, a point at some, at some point there, a trade-off between strictly aesthetics and actually a functional machine. And uh, I, I think that uh, everyone likes to find a nice balance something that is overall appealing and uh, still can uh, still can be somewhat practical. Mm -hmm. I really like this one because I had one myself. I had the XLCH as a 72, the uh, AMF. That was the first year uh, AMF took over Harley Davidson back then. And I took mine down the Mississippi and back and took it to Virginia and that's when I was in the Navy. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, there's something to be said for that because of course these were very rudimentary machines compared to what we're accustomed to today's. Mm -hmm with was, nice comfortable seats and plush suspension. I was suspensions. 21 at the time, so I didn't know any difference. I had, a, I had the front end chopped on it and everything, uh -huh. hog back wheel on it. So. But of course, then there is the fun factor, sure. which uh, you, can, you can never uh, lose sight of uh, how essential that is. And that's a big, uh, big part of the appeal, of course, of these vintage machines that everyone enjoys just looking at them or seeing them go down the road, mm -hmm. hearing them. They have their distinct sound, of course, something from a, a bygone era to, uh, to any extent. And certainly that is true. The older the machine is, the, the more appeal they have in that respect. Right. It brings back a lot of memories. In, indeed, and yes. that's a that's a big part of it right there. Mm -hmm. Folks just love to see these old machines and say, wow, I remember, mm -hmm. or, or I had one, or dad had one, or right. the next door neighbor had one. Right. And that in itself certainly lends to uh, the general overall interest.
We're back here with Larry. What do you got for us, Larry? Well, you know, one of the coolest things is you saw the bikes that were, were raced on flat track, but there's a lot of cool examples of what guys and gals rode to go to the country fair. One of the most iconic bikes that I can think of is the 1967 Bonneville, known as the T. 120R. When you hear about doing the ton, these are one of the machines that do 100 miles an hour. Twin carb, all original, all original, owned by Steve Sopcich. And you know, when I talked to my touring and travel director, Roy Dykeman, Roy Dykeman had this very same model. And when you talk about as a younger kid, what we used to tour on, Roy, tell yes. us a little bit about that. That was uh, the bike that I toured on. I bought my bike in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, from Capital Cycle. And I rode it from DC. I was at the Marine Barracks, 8th and I. I rode it from there uh, home here on the weekends. Or, Triumphs uh, used to be real big back in the 60s oh, and the 70s. It was yeah. a Triumph, it was a BSA, Norton. or the Norton. Norton yep. It was one I of had, those three. I had a 500 Triumph like that. Okay, blue. It was blue then. Yep. yep. Well, I, I my, around with it. <laughs> my friend had a blue one too. Uh -huh. uh, and it was a 500. But an excellent motorcycle. They handled really well. Yeah, I can't remember the gas mileage. <laughs> of course, I'm talking about. And, and they're still making them too. Uh, yeah, talking about what 50 years ago. Oh yeah, yeah. quite <laughs> so, a few years ago. Yeah. But uh, I was a young chap. Yeah. <laughs> when we were young chaps. <laughs> yeah. And that was exactly how mine was. No windshield. When it rained, it felt like somebody was shooting mm. uh, arrows at oh, you. Oh, you got that. Right. <laughs> yeah. But an excellent motorcycle back in the day and you could start it with your arm. Uh -huh. Just pushing down with your hand, you could start them. So that's why I got rid of it. I had a XLCH Sportster. Right, I was gonna say, my XLCH, oh my God, that was the worst one to start. And then sometimes it would it would go all the way through. You'd get up there, get it in the... And nothing there. Nothing there, no, my ear. That's knees. when I sold it, yeah. and that's when I bought the Triumph. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. It wouldn't, uh, wouldn't engage. <laughs> and my knee doesn't bend forward. Yeah, yeah, that was it. That was the old but sports that's what yeah. That's when I traded off on uh, the Bonneville, and I was happy ever after that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the Sportster, sometimes you couldn't uh, get it started. You know, if you three kicks, if it didn't start, you might as well go back in the bar and have another drink. Yeah, British oh, bikes back then were really reliable, real nice yeah. bikes. The only thing bad about them was the... Uh, the electrics on them. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the Lucas. The Lucas. <laughs> like, <laughs> Prince, <laughs> Prince of uh, Darkness. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, British people over there say that a gentleman does not motor about at night. Mm -hmm. So okay. they didn't That's care. Got too away much. with it. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't care too much for the electric. Uh -huh. But yeah, the uh, the amp gauge and the headlights. They used to. Those needles used to break mm -hmm. off all the time. With me now I have uh, Bob Wenzel and, and we got Ted Guthrie back with us also. We're going to talk about this Amachi Sprint. It's an Italian bike and it's uh, Harley used to sell it. Correct. I, I, I think the best way to start out is that me and, me and Ted started a little endeavor together, more of a fun thing called the Vintage Movement. So we, we are into vintage bikes, um, mostly off-road. But when we see something like this, this really caught our eye. I was telling him, a girl that does massotherapy with me, uh, she told me she had some bikes, and me and Ted went over there and looked at them, and uh, we uh, basically loaded this up and uh, came away with it. And, um, uh, you know, we started working on it. Like I told him, I'm, I'm good at tearing stuff apart. And Ted's good at putting uh -huh. stuff back together. And um, we, we looked up the, the color this year. It was blue. It was an off blue. I don't even know what you call that. But um, we, 
we didn't think that was a, a Harley color, and so we looked it up and they made, I think, Ted red and yellow that year. And we decided on yellow, which turned out, this is, a, this is actually a Harley yellow color painted professionally by a guy that paints uh, cars and, and, and things like that, a friend of ours, uh, 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 Mario, over between Salem and Damascus. Uh, he's a mechanic and um, he does fantastic work. And then, um, so I tear stuff apart and we see what parts we're gonna need and work on that. And Ted, I was, like I was telling him, Ted did all the, these are new spokes, but Ted did all the polishing and, and um, yeah, Mark, what's, it, what's it mean? Well, it's um, um, in, a, in Italian, I don't remember, okay. <laughs> to be perfectly honest uh -huh. with you. I know but, all the uh, good words in Italian. I'm Italian. I know all the good words. Most of, most <laughs> of these companies actually came about post-World War II uh -huh. when uh, Europe was trying to get back on its feet transportation-wise, and they started out just uh, building little tiddler bikes there, and it managed to stick around for quite a while until basically they got steamrolled by the competition. Mm -hmm. Now. The bike that you're seeing right here is actually a very good example of what can be done with a modest budget and really just a fixer-upper. Now we managed to make it look pretty good, but you'd be surprised all of the concessions and the shortcuts and the, you know, just a coming up a little bit short of a really pure full-on full restoration and still have a nice looking, nice running bike that uh, catches everyone's eye and uh, truly represents what the things look like originally. So. Uh, by and large, there's a lot that can be done without going, uh, you know, fully into an all-out all restoration, but still come away with a very nice piece of equipment. Let me ask you a question. Where's the frame? <laughs> very, very good question. Well, this, yeah, well, this is a this is a good example of a uh, just a uh, a suspended uh, frame design where the uh, it just has a very large backbone hidden up underneath the tank and everything there. Engine is simply suspended from it. That's all that was necessary for this particular arrangement. That was it, it worked. Yes, yes indeed. It doesn't look like it'd be safe. There's actually a 350 Sprint flat track model right over there that uh, uh, Neil Perry brought in. And uh, so that's a good example of stripped down and they raced it and it's right over there. It's blue and uh, it's up on a pedestal over there. So it's the same bike basically. So, so how many years did Harley sell this bike? Well, let's see. Now, the Sprints came along in the early, well, uh, late 1950s. They started uh, importing them, and they uh, they carried over. This is one of the very last ones. They went through 1974, if I remember correctly. So this was toward the end of the run. Basically, they were getting outdated, and they just could not uh, keep up the pace with the uh, you know, the competition, the refinement, and the performance, and the reliability of some of the newer machines. This again is a, is a very old design. So, hey, everything, uh, everything needs to keep pace with the times or it's just simply gonna get pushed back. What was the spike like when you picked it up? You know, th that's, a, that's a good point, Rick, to make as far as if you'd like to fix up an old bike, you'd like to do something along the lines of some level of a restoration, the very best thing you could do, start out with the nicest, most complete example you can get your hands on. That's really the key. Now this particular machine, to your, car, point, yeah. mm -hmm. to your point, Rick, it was very complete. It was pretty much intact. It was pretty much all original. So we had a lot to start with. We had a great starting point. The more pieces you have to go chasing, the more components that are missing, the things you're uncertain about, you don't know what cor is correct or is not correct. So uh, that we all had to work with. And in addition to that, so many things that you see here, believe it or not, are all original and they were simply cleaned up, polished up, reconditioned, and reused. All the original parts. Most of the fasteners on this bike are the original fasteners. The alloy was still really good. They polished up extremely well. There you go. It's pieces we did not have to replace, fabricate, or locate. The original exhaust system was quite bulky. On this single cylinder machine, it was actually a twin exhaust. They had a Y pipe up front and two big flat mufflers, which I just personally considered to be rather unappealing. So we took the big step and chose that very simplistic exhaust system, made that change, but everything else that you see here is pretty much correct and original, and that's the way we wanted so it. So we're talking 100% Italian bike here, and Harley just slapped her name on it to sell for sales. They it, had a deal, yeah, they had a deal with, with, with Aramaki, and uh, that's what they did, but what Ted, I try to take Ted with me because I'm the opposite of Ted. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wanna buy everything. <laughs> 
Every, everything uh, we go to, you know, we just go to a lot of dirt bikes, and I just, it's just an, a great example of an old dirt bike, but there, there's things like title. Title's very, very important. You can get titles, but it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot of work and hassle and, and, and expense. Um, spark, you know, the, every time we look at a bike, you know, does it have spark? And some people say, well, yeah, it does, or we have to check ourselves, because mm -hmm. um, that can be a little tricky, you know, with electrical uh, mm -hmm. things, so spark. And, you know, we look at bikes like this all the time. Well, I don't have a title, I don't have a key, it doesn't have spark, then we're like, so I usually look at to Ted and say, what do you think, you know? because you have to get it for a certain price. You, we know what we're gonna get into bikes to get them to where they're uh, saleable, you know, and, and you want them to run. And I, I want every bike in my shed to run, right. you know. You just don't want to say, well, push it in the corner, it doesn't so run. What are we talking, how many bikes do you have? Oh gosh, probably 100. How about you, Ted? Uh, between the two of us, we do have approximately 100 machines at any given time. Hey guys, thank you for your time. Really interesting to talk to. I love it. I'm learning so much here tonight. You, you know, you think you know everything, and then he's talk to guys like you, and you're just like... Well, if, you, if you'd really like to get an experience and an education, come on out to the Vintage Movement Shop, and we'll, we'll show you plenty at? more. North Benton, uh, Ohio. Yeah, North Is it, you have a website? Yes, we do. The Vintage Move... Uh, www.vintage-movement.com. Uh, uh, or look us up on Facebook. Larry, what a fun night we had here tonight, huh? Yeah, you know what? I can't thank Armstrong Street Scene and you guys for coming out. You know, this is the 20th edition of a motorcycle exhibit at the National Packard Museum. And I got to tell you, there's too many to name. But without the help of the Bruce Williams and the Ron Craigs and the Kevin Hilliards and the Terry Baxters, those kind of guys and all of the rest of the team that puts this together every year. And also my media friends from TV21, Casey Malone, Armstrong, can't thank you guys enough. This is the 20th edition of the National Packard Museum's Two Wheels at the County Fair. See you there. <laughs> it was fun having you again, Larry. We had you on here about three years ago, and uh, hopefully we'll get you back on again. Well, I'm hoping that uh, I'll get a pay raise this time. Hey, well, we could, we could talk about that. <laughs> what do you think, Greg? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again, guys. Larry, thanks, thanks for helping us out tonight. It was, it was a lot of fun, and, and if, you can, if you can make it, it's called the Two Wheels at the County Fair at the National Packer Museum, the 20th Annual Vintage Motorcycle Exhibit here in Warren, Ohio. I'm Rick Guerrera, along with Larry Ward. We'll see you down the road.